Good afternoon and welcome back to Stories with Don, reading Robin Hood. And today we are going to read chapter three and it is entitled, Will Scarlet Joins the Band. One day, soon after Little John had joined the band, he and his master, Robin Hood, took their bows and went in search of a fat buck, for the hollow oak which far formed their larder was empty. About midday, the two outlaws saw a fine herd of deer before them at the far side of an open grassy space in the forest. Yonder is the buck we want, little John, said Robin Hood. He pointed to a noble stag, feeding quietly at a short distance from the herd of which he was the lord and master. Then this is the best way to take him, said little John. The wind is blowing from the herd toward us. I will work around till the great heart can set me on the breeze. He will rush in this direction, and you will then have an easy shot. They agreed upon this plan, and Little John was just about to move away when he stopped short and pointed but said nothing. Robin Hood looked and saw a young man step into the open space from a forest path. The stranger wore a gay dress of scarlet and carried a longbow with the while a stout broadsword hung at his side. And when they say a gay dress, that just means he wasn't wearing a dress, okay? He was just dressed in a fancy manner, all right? So he was not wearing a dress. Um, no sooner had he left the narrow path than his glance fell upon the herd of deer and the great stag, which now raised its head and tossed its antlers at the sight of this scarlet-clad figure stamped along the earth. Who can this gay spark be, said Robin Hood? Again, I just want to emphasize, gay in this book does not mean gay the way we mean it today. It just means um, flamboyant, happy, um, yeah but not gay like we mean gay. Who can this gay spark be, said Robin Hood? I do not know him, replied Little John in a low tones. He is not of the forest. By my faith, I should say not, returned the leader. Yonder suit of scarlet shines like a fire among the trees. It were better for him to wear a dress of good Lincoln green if he wishes to walk in the forest. "'Tis some fop out of the town come to walk in the greenwood. But just at this moment, the two watchers saw a feat which brought a murmur of admiration to their lips. The stranger had strung his bow, snatched an arrow from his quiver, and laid it on the string. The movement had startled the stag, and he had given the alarm, and the whole herd was fleeing silently and swiftly. Several hinds had gathered round the mighty heart as if to protect their lord, and it seemed hopeless to think of getting a shot at him. But just on the edge of the trees, the stag bounded out and headed the herd for a moment. That moment was enough. The string twanged, the arrow flew, and the stag pitched forward headlong and lay still, the shaft buried up to the feather in his dappled side. By our Lord, that is a noble shot, murmured Robin Hood. This is no fop from town, little John. Do you stay here while I go to speak with him? So little John remained in hiding in a thicket, and Robin Hood walked up to the stranger, who now stood beside the great deer which he had slain. Well shot, well shot, said Robin as he marched up to the place. Yon shaft was loosed in the very nick of time, stranger. The young man in scarlet looked coolly at Robin, but made no answer. I love a bold bowman, went on Robin Hood, and draw to me all that I can. Wilt thou become a yeoman of mine, stranger? And pray, who art thou? said the young man in scarlet, and his tone was rather scornful. And why should I become thy yeoman? It seems to me thou art some kind of forester. Aye, truly I am, replied Robin. And herd the deer for the king, went on the young man. Aye, truly, for the king of Sherwood, chuckled Robin. 
Whether King of England or King of Sherwood, it is all one to me, drawled the gallant. Take thine own way, good Forester, and trouble me not. I want naught to do with thee. And if I am not of a mind to take my way, what then? demanded Robin. Why, by my faith, thou wilt remain at peril of a beating, returned the other. This seems a cool fellow, said Robin to himself. I will make trial of him and see if his courage is as great as it seems. So while the young man in scarlet began to examine the horns of the deer he had shot, as calmly as if no one stood within a mile of him, Robin secretly slipped an arrow on the string. Then he gave a great shout, Ha! and stamped his foot. The young man turned and saw Robin's bow bent, and an arrow laid fully upon his heart. But he changed not his color and gave no start, only said in a rather vexed tone, Get thee gone, Forester, what means this fool's play? Call you an arrow between your ribs, fool's play, growled Robin Hood. I am an outlaw and the men enemy of all such gay sprigs as you. Fling down your purse at my feet, and quickly too, lest I loose the string. Ay, are you of that company then? said the young man in a tone of mild surprise. Well, well, there is strong argument in a grey goose shaft, and he turned as if to unloose his purse from his girdle. But instead of loosing the purse, he clapped an arrow to his own bow and bent the ladder with wonderful speed, so that there they faced each other, both in act to shoot. And Robin, who had never dreamed of letting his arrow fly, saw that he was likely to be paid back in his own coin. "'Hold thy hand!' cried Robin. "'Hold thy hand! We are likely to slay each other, and there is no advantage in that.' "'None at all that I can see,' replied the stranger coolly. "'But the game was of thy beginning, not mine.' "'Then I end it,' said Robin Hood, and took his arrow from the string. "'The stranger did the same and stood waiting. "'You carry sword and buckler,' said Robin. "'So do I. "'Twere shame for us to part without seeing who is the better man.' So they betook themselves to a flat piece of turf, turf beneath the wide-spreading branches of a mighty oak, and each man arranged his buckler on his left arm and took his good broadsword in his right arm, right hand. Then to work they went, cutting and thrusting, fainting and parrying. Clash, clang went the heavy broadswords time and again on the stout bucklers as the blows were deftly caught and warded off. So equal were the combatants that they fought for a good half hour, and neither had been touched, nor had either of them given way for an inch before the other. At length, the combat was ended by a lucky stroke made by the stranger. He cut at Robin's head, and the outlaw's buckler did not entirely check the blow. The point of the gallant sword nicked Robin along the top of the forehead, and blood poured down and filled his eyes so that he could no longer see to fight. As soon as Little John saw that his master was disabled, he sprang from the, his hiding place and ran up to the spot. "'Give me your sword,' he cried to Robin Hood, "'and he shall try a bout with me, master. I can play with sword and buckler.' "'Nay, nay, Little John,' cried Robin Hood, wiping the blood out of his eyes. "'There has been enough sword play. "'Twere shame to set a fresh man on one who has fought so long and so well. "'And a fair and honest fighter, too.' He hath never offered a stroke while I have been at disadvantage. I am bound to obey, grumbled the big fellow, but I like it not that this gay spark may brag to his cronies that he drew blood from Robin Hood and went unscathed from it. For the first time, the gallant in Scarlet began to show interest. Robin Hood, he cried eagerly, and I have met Robin Hood and fought him and yet not known him? Why should you know me, said, cried Robin. Who are you? Who am I, laughed the youth in scarlet. Why, a few years ago you would have known me at once, and I you. Robin, you have forgotten Will Gamewell? Forgotten my only cousin, said Robin Hood. No, never. But can you be he? 
Are you the lad I used to go birds nesting with, and whom I taught first to draw a bow? Yes, I know your smile now and your voice. Well, to think we should have fought each other. The two cousins shook hands heartily, and then little John took Gamewell's hand in turn. But what are you doing in the forest, Will? asked Robin Hood. Looking for you, Robin, was the answer. You must know that I am an outlaw, too. I have fled to the forest with a man's blood on my hands, though it was not shed willingly. You remember old Grim, the steward? Ay, that I do, that scurvy old knave, replied Robin. If it was he you killed, you had good reason for it, I warrant. You shall hear, replied Will. You know that our lands run with the chase of Baron de Lacy, our Norman neighbor. De Lacy has long coveted our estate to round off his great possessions, and as my father is now old and has no children except me, the Norman thought to slay me and then get a grant of our lands as being without an heir. The rascal, cried Robin, but the trick hath been played before and with success too. Well, how did you fare with him, cousin? I was out shooting with the bow the other day, went on Will, and Grim came with me. I was waiting at a gap for a deer to pass when some feeling, I know not how it sprang up in my heart, caused me to turn, and there was Grim bending his bow, the arrow laid upon me. To save myself, I loosed a shaft at him, and we shot together. His arrow tore my doublet, but mine went through his body, and he was a dead man within five minutes. Yet in that time he confessed that he had agreed with the Lacy to slay me for a great reward and a high position in the Norman's household. Foul Norman treachery, cried Robin Hood. They are ever ready to strip the Saxon by any means, and the fouler the practice, the better they like it. And what happened to you then, cousin? Why, as ill luck would have it, the manner of the steward's death came to the Norman's ear at once, and he set the sheriff speedily on my track. You see, his purpose would have been just as well served if he could see me strung up by rope for what he called the murder of the rogue Grimm. Ay, ay, replied Robin Hood. That is easy enough to see. So you fled to the good Greenwood, cousin? Welcome to Sherwood and our forest company. This is John, little John, the biggest of us all and second in our band. Will Gamewell and little John shook hands again, and Robin went on. But as we will drop your old name, but we will drop your old name, Will. "'Tis best to put aside a name for the owner of which the law is in hot pursuit. "'You come in Scarlet, and Scarlet you will be called. "'Will Scarlet art thou from this day, my cousin?' "'Good!' cried Little John. "'Will Scarlet he shall be in our band, master, "'and with a new name he shall be a new man, and free of the forest.' So Will Scarlet entered Robin Hood's company and swore to be true to the forest laws and the forest ways. And I will give you the great stag as my first footing, laughed Will Scarlet. Let it be for a feast of friendship on my joining your goodly company. Robin Hood laughed and applauded the speech. We were in search of venison when you appeared, Will, he said, and I had marked down this heart bef bef which fell before your strong bow. Now we will carry it to our meeting place, and it shall be as thou sayest. We will feast high today on this rich venison. And that ends that chapter. I hope you have a good rest of the afternoon, that your day is well, that you stay healthy, and may God bless you. Bye.